So my name is Chris Tart, I'm a director at uh, GlideCode, and one of my uh, <coughs> one of my portfolios, not really portfolios, but one of the things that I have a passion for, and uh, I've kind of eaten my heart was into having giving me an opportunity to have a passion for is uh, growth and development. And this morning I'm going to share a little bit of the story of growth and development at GlideCode. So this is a five-year experiment going on, six years experiment that we've been running inside the organisation. Started with three people, one of them sitting in front of me at the moment. The others. Um, and uh, so the idea was to try and understand how we can start growing people in a different and unique way. And today I'm going to share you five years of learning and growth, and we're constantly learning and sharing. Um, so we'll yeah, go through. So the goals for this morning's presentation would be one, to go through the motivation. There are three motivations as to why we would consider going through mentoring um, and development in some sort of agile process and we'll cover those three in a fair amount of depth. Then we'll move on to the agile process. What does this process look like? We'll look at the personas that we've introduced into this uh, into this framework. Uh, we'll look at the patterns, some of the anti-patterns, and then look at what the outcomes were inside our organization. Because we, we, we're, uh, we're an organization that plots everything so we're able to assess where we are with things. So the genesis for this thinking <coughs> came from these two gentlemen. Anybody know who any of these two gentlemen are? Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. That's right. Anybody got any idea who this guy is? All right, so a French man. His name is Howard Muscovitz. And Howard is the reason why when you go into the, uh, into the cereal aisle of the of the shopping centre, you will find thousands of cereals. And how it started his research into what is the best Pepsi and what is the best spaghetti sauce. And he discovered that there isn't one best Pepsi and there isn't one best Pepsi, uh, spaghetti sauce. There are many different Pepsis for many different people. So there's three or four Pepsis or three or four spaghetti sauces suited to different types of people. And that's got to do with chemistry in the mouth, feel, touch, and things that go along in the brain. And I started thinking, if it's that complex for Pepsi, for goodness sake, I mean, it's a cool drink. How complex could it be when we're actually developing people and taking their career forward? In Kalata Code, we spend a lot of time trying to understand our stuff. We use a 16-kit, we use an EQ, we use a uh, strength finder, of other tools. We have an industrial psychologist on hand. <coughs> spends time trying to understand our stuff. And what we've got to realize is that everybody is different. While we're very, very similar, we're also very, very unique. How unique? Well, if you have a look at Red here, Red is tough minded, he's an introvert, independent, self high self control. He's always connecting on a task. So when you go to speak to Red, We'll start off by talking about what Red's doing, the actual thing that we're doing. Red is an achiever and he seeks autonomy. This incidentally is where we would care most about developers in the organization, but that's another conversation. If we wanted to start changing what the face of development look like, we would need to start thinking about what that individual would start looking like. If you look at Rivet at blue, blue and red are actually quite close to each other, but they're fairly unique and different. Oops. Introverted, tough-minded, accommodating. So while Red tries to work independently and has got very strong thoughts, they're slightly more accommodating. Connects by task, it's a learner, it's analytical, and seeks creativity. These are elements, incidentally, are the things that drive them, the things that give them energy inside the organization. And while they may have very similar personalities, the things that drive them and their motivating factors are very, very different. And this becomes quite complex when you start getting a whole lot of people together. <coughs> you look at yellow, extroverted, so now we're moving away from the introverted part of the organization, tough-minded, accommodating, low self-control, so yellow likes to break the rules, likes to test the rules, likes to make sure that we're not just following things blindly. Connected by interaction. So when you go to speak to Yellow, start by asking Yellow, how's mum? How's dad? How's the kids? Because Yellow likes the connection via people. 
is responsible and seeks service. So likes to likes to service inside the organization. Green is an extrovert, <coughs> receptive, accommodating, low self-control, connects by interaction. So green and yellow are very, very similar. So if you look at those four individuals, they actually make up a really great team. There's a very good dynamic inside the organization. There's a very good uh, healthy tension between trying to break the rules and trying to keep the rules and trying to connect by task but trying to connect by interaction. So if there's this uniqueness inside an organization, and incidentally these are probably four people inside the organization which work really, really well together, but at the same time are very, very unique and very different. So if that's the case, why the hell are we trying to push everybody into the same gray box in HR? Why are we trying to go through KPOs and KPIs, which aren't bad, please understand, I still see value in them, but we shoehorn everybody into the same type of concept. That's motivating factor number one. Motivating factor number two is that life gets in the way. Life is unapologetic. It arrives on your doorstep one morning, does its business, and leaves. And it's, you've, got, you've got to figure out what to do. So when I'm entering my mentees, I spend time talking about this diagram. We have this concept of work, that's what we come to every single day for five days a week. And this drives an ability to make cash. And that gives us an ability to have a personal life. To do the things that we love doing, things that give us energy. Go for a run, go climb a mountain, go out to dinner with friends. But in order to make our work more rewarding and to make ourselves grow and make this personal life a little bit more rewarding, we need to tackle this thing called career. Career allows us to be more valuable to the organization and allows us to make more value and so you know, enrich our personal lives. What we've got to be careful about is that career doesn't go into work because then you end up being modeled like a company, which is okay, but it's not great. We want to make sure that there's a healthy balance between work and career and personal life. And as we grow older, we have personal responsibility. We have a partner, we have children, we have parents that age, and this gets bigger. And so the question is, how do we balance these? The difficulty is that we only have two <coughs> resources, and they're not infinite. You have time and you have energy. They're not infinite resources. And if you don't balance them correctly, you head for burnout. So you're going to need to balance the growth of your career and the work that you do with your personal life and your personal responsibility so that you don't need burnout. So uh, when we get to a point where personal responsibility is huge, for example, you've just got a new baby on the way, men and women need to be able to accommodate for this. This becomes a very difficult thing to balance and so we need to Maybe still focus on career, but, but, but make it small, go to get a little bit smaller. Personal life is obviously going to take up the knock, and we can't really renege what we agree to do in, in work. And so we need to figure out how to balance the growth of our career with this personal responsibility change. The other question is how do we grow the industry? When Palatico started, there were five of us. Three of us had lost our jobs, we were retrenched, and we started a new company and we brought two staff members along with us. We didn't have the luxury of being able to go to an industry and just get the, the best people that we could get the best people. Actually, we just had to get what we could afford. And it turns out we actually got the best people. We really did. We got people who do not have degrees, but are yet the most amazing developers we've ever worked with and are still to this day with us. We got testers. One of my best testers is an industrial environment, environmental scientist. Another good tester is an electrician. Dude, have you ever seen an electrician fault find? <laughs> an amazing, amazing. We have an amazing BA who was in the dungeons at Old Mutual. An ability to get out and work. And I also have an amazing scrum master who's an adult educator. Knows exactly how to interact with people. Those are people that have come outside the industry into the industry and have helped us grow and thrive. And in this day and age of knowledge work and the ability for us to be able to move 
into new spaces with AI looming, we have to think about how we're going to integrate people outside our industry into our industry, because this industry is growing and it's at a lack of people. So we have this problem to, to, to deal with. So now we've got three problems or obstacles or challenges in front of us. People are very, very different, and so how do we motivate them and how do we keep them going? Life is always going to get in the way. There's always going to be this complexity. It's not ever going to be simple. And we need to grow our knowledge base. How do we do it? Well, we, we're in similar problems when we run into projects, aren't we? We don't know what's coming in the software world. We don't know when we open up a piece of software, is this thing going to be a ball of mud, or is it going to be an amazing piece of software? And so if we think about it from that perspective, why don't we try an agile approach? And that's exactly what we did. We tried an agile approach to mentoring. And it looks something like this. So we start with a role definition and role framework. And at the beginning, we do some planning for about seven days. It's not rocket, it's not the cost in stone. You can go two weeks um, to connect with the person. But we plan what's actually going to be in the pipeline for the next 90 days. And we execute. And while we're executing, we connect. We connect regularly with the person. We insist on getting some face time. Regular, the most optimum would probably be two weeks. Now in this meeting, can anybody hazard a guess what this meeting would look like? What questions would we ask? For a ball, for beer. <laughs> progress on, on those objectives and goals that you set. That progress? How would that look? It's a one-on-one -on -one discussion with measures that you would have set out at the beginning and you determine how you track and get to those. Sorry. Yep. It looks something like this. What did you do last time we met? What have you done since last time we met? What are you planning to do the next time we meet? What are your... What are your... What are your... Oh, your impediments? It feels like a stand-up. In fact, that's exactly where it is. It's not quite as mercenary as what did you do? Where are you going? No, it's, it's a little bit more engaging, but that's the style of interaction that we're doing. We're always looking for feedback, looking to see how we can adjust this progress path that you're on. At the end of this 90-day cycle, we get together and we reflect. This is the retrospective. We spend some time looking at how did you, how did you go through this last 90 days? What are the difficulties? What are the things that you're facing? What are the things that you think you've learned and didn't learn? What are the things you feel like you've covered ground, but you've already covered them in your job? So that we can plan for the next 90 days and then we go, start again. Out of this drops out some <coughs> assessments, and those assessments can be kept by the mentor or head off to HR to be able to say this person's moving forward, or we need to be able to figure out a way to motivate this person or get some learning material on a course. So that's it, quite simple. But how do we manage this process? The easiest way to manage it is just to take the growth to a board. And boards are cheap. Trello boards are super, super cheap. cheap. I mean, I have hundreds of them. But Tucker from Trello is always telling me what DIY I've got to do and all these crazy things that we seem to run our entire household on boards and maybe it's a natural extension software into the normal space that we work on. But a board may look something like this. We take a goal, quite a large, hairy, audacious <coughs> item, and we make that, and we put it like an entity epic for those of you who are close to the scrum uh, metaphor. And we break that into some deliverables. We can liken that to the story. And we take that and break it down once more into an action. Probably called task. My actions need to be small. They need to be things that you can objectively say you did or you didn't do. All right, and this in encourages us to keep a flow through the system. And so, if we were going to build an a REST API, we might say, well, build a single point REST API. Don't, don't build a whole REST API. You don't have to think too big about it. Just start by building a single endpoint. And maybe the person doesn't understand anything to do with REST, and so we're going to ask him to read some books. Read chapters 1 through to 3 and prove that you can actually understand what you've actually done. It's a very simple and easy conversation. You're done, move it to done. And maybe you will create some swagger documentation, 
uh, go to go and do some learning about Swagger, but you create some documentation that you mocked out your API a little, and then you start creating single entry points in C Sharp. So these are simple objectives for somebody to be able to move their career from point A to point B. The trick is you actually have to make this growth holistic. You can't just focus on technical skills. You actually need to be able to balance it with some soft behavior skills. And for this, we have developed a soft skill matrix that tells us that whichever part of your career you are and whatever lane you're in, these are the behaviors that you need to do. But what we also do is we actually find that the soft skills come out when we actually have face-to-face -face connection time. So you know that connection time that I showed you during the 90-day process? That is mandatory. You don't get to, to, to move away from a meeting. You don't need, get to come up to me and say, Chris, I haven't got anything to show you. I think I want to skip the meeting. No. That's the opportunity to find the soft skills. And I'll give you an example. So the young guy that I'm mentoring, it's called an Ed. I don't, have, I don't want to embarrass anybody inside the organization. Ed comes to me one day and he says, Chris, I can't meet you tomorrow. I haven't got anything to show you. I say, Ed, that's fine, but we're still going to meet. So I don't have anything to show you. Ed, don't worry. I'm not going to get upset with you. This is your career. You decide the path that you want to go, but I still want to meet. And Ed fought and fought and fought. In fact, the next morning you're still fighting. And we sat down together and said, Ed, tell me about your last two weeks. And he started to unpack his two weeks to me. And it became blatantly obvious that Ed, that Ed actually had no plan. He had no daily structure to what the hell he was actually doing. It's a really difficult thing. And so what we did was we parked his technical thing and we said, Ed, you don't actually know how to plan your day. So how about you do a daily plan and see if you can stick to it for the next week or so, and then we'll, we'll chat and see where you go. That was cool. You know, he got his plan together, started working, technical stuff started getting, getting moving forward a little bit. But it wasn't going at the pace that I expected it to go. And so we had another impact decision. Ed, what the hell's going on here, dude? We've got a daily structure, and it turns out that Ed has a problem prioritizing. But you would never have known that if he had skipped that meeting. So the most important aspect is to connect to get feedback, to look at it, and say, why would this person be having a particular problem? So now he's got two problems he has to solve. He has to solve prioritization of his tasks, and he has to solve, and he has to have some structure in his day so that he can plan and move things forward. The other thing that we have brought into this thing is to bring in some personal life elements. Now, we talked about personal life as being something that we want to do balance. But it's really interesting that when you start asking people what do you want to achieve outside of this organization, there's some really interesting things that come out. I want to run Conrad's. I want to run 10Ks. I want to stop smoking. I want to... I, geez, I want to buy a house. I want to buy a car. There's a whole lot of things that come out. And the really cool thing about bringing these items onto the board is that you become, you, as a mentor, start knowing about them and you bring them into the organization. And so we start broadcasting. X just stopped smoking, yay! Somebody just finished Comrades, yay! And it's a massive amount of celebration inside the organization. The endorphins and the psychological effects of that are amazing. And so the important element is to start bringing some personal elements into the growth and development inside your organization. So your board starts to take on something that looks like this. Technical themes, personal life themes, and then you have your goals, your deliverables, and your actions. And I don't know, I've used the theme here, I'm not going to drag on it too much, but I don't know how many times Clarica has helped a young person buy a house. Because young people do not know how to buy houses and they need a lot of guidance. So somebody will come to me and say, I need to buy a house. So what's your credit rating look like? Why is that important? That's really important so that we get a good rate and we start having a conversation and educating around <coughs> how people need to take care of their cash. So this is a very holistic approach to mentoring. And where we go. All right, anybody ever mention, mentored anyone? One to <laughs> What's your biggest gripe with mentoring people? <laughs> Come on, was it fun? Okay. The time and effort. We don't say They expect you to do the work. Okay, so that's one of the big ones. They expect you to do the work. Anything else? Getting that engagement. Getting engaged, you feel like you're lecturing. 
It's not from trying, you're trying to help, yeah. but there's no reciprocal yes. uh, conversation. Yeah, the reciprocal part, trying to motivate, trying to get connection, introduces some to your level of trust, getting that level of trust. Getting the trust going, which is hard, that takes time, and it's just natural level of trust. Is the best way to do it is to get, get connected. So I just took on a new team with half the team from, from my clients and half the team from my side. And the only way we got trust, or well, the fastest way we got trust, is we have coffee every single morning. Connect, 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 see how silly people are, take that funny little joke and make it part of the team vibe. But you have to connect and you need FaceTime. It's a pattern that's coming up. Right. The other thing is that it actually feels like a big load on your side. Right, and that's what we found inside the organization. Mentors were expected to do an, an amazing amount of work, heavy amount of work, and that was very difficult. So we created these concepts called, well, we created personas inside the organization. So to start off, we defined the mentee. And you'll notice there, Sean, sure. it says, take responsibility for your own career. We need to define it. You need to work closely with it. You can't just tell somebody to take responsibility and expect that they're going to do it. So there's some things that we need to do, but at least setting the expectation up front is a very good, very good thing to do. And you need to make sure that they listen and they keep an open mind, because often they don't. They, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit now when we start getting into the growth framework and we start showing you what, what we start laying out, and people are like, well, how do I do this? I want, to, I want to learn these patterns. It's important because you've got to be able to be a software developer. And we created this guy called the Mentor. Well, he's always been the pivotal part of this conversation. We started to define that he shapes the mentee's career, that he removes the impediments. So this is feeling very strong mastery. Um, he listens and keeps an open mind. He's firm and fair. So Ed, you're not, you're not missing a meeting. We're going to have a conversation. You're a good connector. So sometimes not everybody can be a mentor. And that's another reason for creating personas, so that you can give people an opportunity in your organization to get some growth. Generally, quite well read in terms of the broad knowledge of where things are going so that he can defend the positions that he's actually taking the person down or she can. <coughs> We've also created this, this persona called a coach and we're busy experimenting at the moment with this, with this coach concept. So coaches actually spend a fairly long period of time with an individual but they're not the, the person that's focused on growing that person's career. The mentor's focused on growing the person's career. The coach is actually with the person to actually grow something, somebody in a technical sphere. And so they will spend three to four, six, eight month, year with that person for a year. Another good opportunity to connect. What we've started experimenting with now is to actually break this concept of coach out into two new concepts. One called the head coach. And when, when, you're, when you're coaching young people, you don't really need to mentor them started to figure out that head coaches are far better in terms of groups of young people so that you can start scaling this process out. And then we created this concept called a technical coach. And so a head coach will be looking at the guy's career, looking at some high level code, trying to decide where they're actually going to go. And you'll call in a technical coach to be able to actually take that person through something new. So I have a young person on my team at the moment and I'm not quite mentoring, I'm coaching him. I meet with him every two weeks, have a look at his code, so great, got a problem there, got a problem there, got a problem there. I'll speak to his technical coach, Mr. Technical Coach, these are some things that he needs to learn and the technical coach will figure out and work with him and move forward. And the other, the other persona that we've created is this person called the guy. And the guy is a person that's with you for a very short period of time, maybe a day, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, but it's a very short period of time to give you an example. My test is needed to learn how to use Git. The best way to do it was to find a developer who is good with people and can put, put ideas down and say, Jack, Simon, can you please teach this person how to use Git? And they spend Fridays for two hours, for three weeks, and they're a guy and they're out. Now the great thing about these personas is that you actually give everybody an opportunity in the organization to contribute back into the development. Because it will it'll surprise you just how many people want to help other people grow. It really is an interesting dynamic when you start to, to get into it. And so this group of personas allows us to exercise that while giving the mentor the ability to actually not get crushed under the weight of trying to take somebody's career from A to B. So some of the mentoring patterns, we're going to go into these a little bit more depth. 
The first one is always listen. Feedback is key. So the one thing around doing an agile process, and the reason why we have agile, is to get regular feedback. I mean, really, software development is actually just a closed system. You've got to get something from A to B, and you've got to figure out how to do it in the most effective way to do it. And the only way to do that is to get feedback through your system. And so when you do Scrum, your daily stand-up is the first feedback point. Your end of sprint retrospective is the second feedback point. So you're constantly getting this feedback as to how we're doing and where we're going. Right, so you've always got to listen. FaceTime is important. We're about to start experimenting with doing this remotely. We'll see what that happens, but right now I can tell you that connecting FaceTime is very, very important. Always need time to reflect. What are we doing and where are we going? Always need to look for feedback. This is the most important aspect. There's patterns inside of it I'm going to share with you today that can only have come out by getting feedback from the people that we were mentoring. First off, those people need to be brave enough to say, this is not working for me, and how can we make it work? And so we develop patterns and anti-patterns to be able to understand and give ourselves a tooling. But the only way we did that was by listening. And we need to do some ad hoc reflection. Every now and again, we need to dive into parts of the organization that we generally think we're doing quite well in. So go into HR and do some reflection on how is this mentoring process going. Go into the director's meeting and say, how is this reflection of this process going? Get a group of young people together and say, how is this thing working for you? So that you can feed back, back into the, into the process. It's a regular thing you do. It, you, you don't need a reason to do it. So the reason is, I need to understand whether this thing is actually working. And what we need to do is be able to create a growth framework. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time on this in the next slides. I don't want to go into too much detail. But the idea behind a growth framework is to give a visual representation of where somebody's going. And we'll show you exactly what that looks like. But the idea is to actually provide avenues, so be able to give people a, a, a map of what that thing could look like, a, a landscape actually of what it could look like, with some paths that they could go down to be able to understand what their career growth could actually look like. And then you spend time when you're in your sessions planning, looking to see where those areas of strengths and weaknesses lie, so that you can actually plan and plot the next version of this person's path. We need to prepare and practice the end game. So we'll talk about this, but this is actually starting to practice the things on a daily basis that you may not get done on a, through your work, but practice them you know, in, your, in your learning time to be able to get better at what you're doing. We'll talk a lot more about that next. We need to baseline our mentees. Now this is an, actually a pattern that came out when two junior developers came to us and said, guys, guys, this API thing that I'm having to do, I do every single day. I know how to build a REST-based API. Don't put me on this thing. Can we try and figure out another way to sort this out? And so this idea about baselining, about taking what they do on a daily basis and contrasting that with the career development path, and saying this is, this is done, you don't need to do it. That's an important aspect. And we need to baseline relatively often. And then what we need to do as well is we need to apply the influence into somebody's career carefully. And when you're at the bottom of the run, when you're a junior developer, that's, you, don't, you don't really need to do that. You actually need to actually be quite draconian. And we'll talk about, a little bit about that. But as you move up the pipe, as you move to the top of a person's career inside your organization, you probably need to apply it a little bit more carefully. And we got this pattern by somebody pushing back and going, guys, this may not be working properly. All right, then we also need to take a holistic approach. So we talked a little bit about a holistic approach. We talked about technical growth. We talked about personal, pers uh, personal growth. And we talked about soft skills growth. But there's some other, other elements that you can add in to spice it up, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then what we need to do, and this is a, a space we're just about to launch into and uh, try and get better at, because we're not really quite strong at this, which is mentor your mentors, coach your coaches, and guide your guides. So this is giving them the framework be able to grow and deliver. Alright, so create a growth framework. So this is kind of what a growth framework looks like. If you're an application developer, I need you to understand some details on API, because we're an enterprise development company. I need you to understand some stuff on UI. I need you to understand some stuff on databases. The greens, those are things you need to do. You need to be practiced at those items. The pebbles, those are the things that you need to be assessed at. Those are the things that you need to start playing with on a daily, but just on a daily or weekly basis in your own time to try and understand whether you could bring those into your daily practice. The reds, out of bounds. Not really, 
they're just out of bounds for your career development. But the reason why we add them there is so that people get an idea of where on earth they could actually go to. And the blues are just the things that we need to be read up on. And so if you follow this path to API, I say, API, API technologies, I need you to be practiced at red, at rest. I need you to be read at soap, because believe me, we still get soap requests and we still have to understand how to consume some wisdom and work through some things. We deal with banks, they don't move very quickly, if at all. And you may actually be aware that there's this new thing called graph theory. So this is the idea of creating a growth framework. In practice, it kind of looks something like this. So there we go. You just start exploring. This is for a normal developer. You start looking at uh, web UI, web UI frameworks, and we start talking to them about what are the different frameworks that you could actually look at. And this person needs to probably be aware of one of the three and so if you start exploding this thing into databases, into development tools, the thing starts popping up and showing you all sorts of interesting items and you now, when you sit talking to somebody in career development, you start to be able to say, well, you've got a good, good balance of, of a UI and some API, but your database, your database understanding is probably not that great. Well, what do we need to go and have a look at? Start exploring where and how we need to get into database development. That's the career growth framework. Best to make it visual. It sucks when it looks it lives on a horrible piece of paper. The visual version is so much better. When you spend time working with individuals, you can actually show them where to go. That you start backing up with when you get to the end of this node, here's some plural side videos you could go and watch. Here's some YouTube videos you could go and watch. Here's some content we've created internally for you to be able to consume. And to start building up that ability for people in your organization to be able to self-service when they're moving forward. It's really an interesting story about self-service when we get to the next slide. So we're on this thing called Prepare for an Endgame. So the concept of this pattern started because graduates from universities are woefully under-equipped to get into your organizations. That's a reality. I can't change it, but we actually have to put it and figure out how to actually move forward. And so we came up with this concept of creating a full stack application, but this thin vertical. Because you'll be surprised at how many young developers don't understand what an RM is. They don't understand, they've never built a REST-based API. They don't know the difference between JSON and XML. And no, I test this stuff when I go through interviews with my young people. It's a very, very sad state of affairs. And so what, what we do to practice our end game is to start as an apprentice, building this application, just a thin line, just one table, with one endpoint, with one list, add, edit, delete, stream. It sounds boring, but it's a lot of fun for people who have never actually developed. And as you start moving through, through the cycle, you start building this application out. And so somebody that's been on this process for three years will have done error logging, will have done exception handling, would have started thinking about how to build this database in an agile fashion, would have scripted all the changes, would have known the technologies that can take a database from version 1 to version 2, start understanding APIs and starting to think about the versions on the API, and start understanding the UIs and how do we deploy each one of these elements, building these items into a small little build. So these things are not complex, they're not difficult to be able to do. And a heuristic for me, to be a developer inside Collider Code is that you built this entire application of a very simple business concept with some complex business technology inside it. And if you can build this, this, this application from beginning to end in a certain period of time, then I trust you to be a developer inside this organization. And that's what we call preparing for the end game. You can bring in some unit testing, you can bring in some integration testing, start preparing people for the end game. So it's an interesting conversation. I talked about giving people an idea about what the, the roadmap might look like, about where the, what direction it is that you should be taking. I'm busy mentoring a young person at the moment on my team. She came to me one day and she said, this is amazing. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, I'm trying to give you an example. This is amazing and the career framework is amazing. She said to me, I've got time on my hands. 
I'm an intelligent young lady, and I've got drive. All I needed was to know where to go. And she spends her evenings for two hours every night putting her application together, and her career is just taking leaps and bounds. Because all she needed to know was which bloody direction do I actually go to in this big space in IT. So, start preparing for an end game. So we talked about applying influence inside your organization and onto, onto somebody's career. And this pattern of cone of influence popped out one day when one of our seniors said to us, so far and no further. And it looks something like this. We have inside any organization junior staff members, what we call the intermediate staff members, and I don't quite understand intermediate to what, but anyway, I'll, I'll live with it. This thing irritates me that so we have seniors and we have leaders. Any organization, any software development organization actually has a structure that looks like that. And what we've realized is that at the bottom, juniors don't really have a choice in where they're going and what they're going to be doing because they actually don't actually know. And so they need heavy influence and a lot of guidance. But as they move up this pyramid to the point of senior, they need to have less of a restrictive guide on what they're actually doing. They need more freedom. So we came up with something that looked something like this. So in our development path, you go from apprentice to junior to intermediate, and um, this is a three-year path, and you don't get much choice. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to, going to deliver. You're going to do error logging. You're going to do error handling. You're going to do exception handling. You're going to figure out how to write a good piece of software well before we let you rush off into industry and start making all kinds of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're in interested in machine learning. I really am. But in order for you to work better at what you're doing, you need some proper guidance. But as you move up into this area over here, to senior and accomplished senior, this is where we start insisting that you not now learn how to PLC. Work with different concepts, work with different technologies, and try and figure out how you can bring them into the work that you're actually doing. Don't physically bring them into the work. Just figure out how you could do it. This could also help us as a department or as an organization set our tech radar. What, if, what technologies are we interested in? Where are we thinking about going? And how do they apply back into our organization? And in certain cases, they help set some of the company direction. Where are we going? What are we doing? The interesting thing about preparing for the end game, and the interesting thing about doing this PSC thing, is that the one thing that bugs me as a consultant is when I have young people arriving onto my team deciding that they're going to use some new technology that they want to pair their CV with. This is a common thing in IT, but it drives me absolutely insane. I want to use this new technology. Why? It doesn't apply. Use graph databases in what context to sort of large amounts of document data? It doesn't apply. So we, 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 we constantly hit this battle. And by giving a person an opportunity to POC in their own space, in their own time, or giving a person an opportunity to build stuff in that full stack application that they developed, you're creating a ground for them to test and play with the new things that they want to play with, and then bring them into your organization. Don't start the other way around. Because what normally happens is somebody stays with you for a year or two, then he buggers off. And you're left with this smitty piece of code that nobody really wants or nobody really likes. Guys are laughing because you know it's bloody well true. We have to create these environments for people to learn and grow in a different way. Alright, so we come back to this holistic growth. So I presented this concept to an icon a couple of years ago. Somebody said to me, I like what you're doing here, but I think you've left out team. I think you've left out an ability to somebody to contribute back into the team. The thing that they're learning, they can actually go back and contribute back into the team. So if the team's running, and they're running on some arcane technology, they know they've got to change it. Well then, give somebody an opportunity to go and learn that technology during their learning time, and, and bring it back into the organization. The same thing for company. As people become more and more senior in your organization, in your department, you give them an opportunity to contribute back. Question. So you mentioned uh, on the, the, the previous slide and here, you mentioned learning time and doing POCs. Do you 
you uh, dedicate the time for that, or how uh, how are they doing this? All right. So can I answer? That? Can I just get to community and then I'll come back and answer that question? So company contribution and as you move up, community contribution. Now this set of things actually straps back to the values of Code, and so community is quite important to us. Um, this may not be something that we'd want to put on there. I'm not dictating, I'm just saying this is an idea of a way in which you can create this. So there was a question at the back. Is there learning time? Yes. All right, so Code has value, tagline value number one, which is learn, grow, deliver. That's our value system. And so in order to stand behind learn, grow, deliver, we create learning time. Every Friday afternoon at 12 o'clock, just after lunch, all projects cease to be in action and everybody starts doing three to four hours worth of learning time. Depends how focused you're on learning time, depends how much you want to join bear o'clock at 3.30, but everybody gets an opportunity to do learning time. It equates to 17 days, 17 to 18 days worth of learning time a year. When you start a company, you get 17 days worth of leave time and so we have an equal amount of leave and an equal amount of learning time which we put back to the, to the individuals. Now is that, in, is that enough? No. The conversation that I normally have with the people that I'm mentoring is that we're giving you this time to learn and grow. It's probably three to four hours a week. I need you to do three to four hours of your own time. Now you have eight hours a week. Now your career is actually moving and growing. But yes, the company does step up and do learning time. Was it easy to implement? No. It started off by one hour on a Wednesday morning. Then it went to two. And then people said, this Wednesday morning thing doesn't work for us. It needs to go to Friday. And then it went to Friday. And then it became the entire afternoon. What's interesting is that in that space, people have created their own ways of sharing and learning. So we have a knowledge sharing session, which happens once a month. We have the young testers coming in and doing their knowledge sharing sessions and sharing ideas. And so if you create that space, people will come in and start learning. But yes, we have to go to that learning time. Is it, is it, does it eat to the bottom line? It does. It's, it's, it is costly. But the benefits that we see in the growth and the connection and the longevity of staff members inside this company is important to us that it actually stays. And so generally people stay in this company for between three to four years. Some of the people have just left at five or six years, but that's really because I think they're outgrown where they were and needed to move on. All right. So this is a new concept and it's just come out and I, when I spoke at uh, the Scrum Gathering in Cape Town, this was the first, first group, they were the first group of people to get this, but uh, this is a fairly new idea. Scrum versus Kanban versus Scrum. So how does this apply into the organization? <coughs> what we realized is that young people that need very specific growth, and where you're still trying to understand where they're actually growing, they actually need something that can change very quickly. So has anybody ever tried implementing Scrum on a service desk before? I have about 15 years ago and I was still scrum mad and scrum could solve everything and try to do it on a help desk and it doesn't work because you don't have enough resources you, you can't plan time for this week we're going to do this or this day we're going to do that because the service desk requires quick interaction and so that idea behind Kanban actually is important but that element actually translates back into somebody who's junior because you're still growing and you're still moving quite quickly and so you want to make the tasks as small as possible, you want to restrict the number of tasks that they're working through, and you want to get some flow going through quickly so that you can start finding the areas where they actually need to be focusing on quite quickly. So that's important for Canva. But as you start moving up up the technology, up the, 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 the ladder inside your organization to more senior people, that's where a more scrum based element will start being applied. Where you can start saying, these are the things we're going to do for this three weeks for this this 90 days, you can plan them up front, you can bring them through, and you can reflect on them. So we, there is a distinct difference between Kanban and Scrum. So this is a junior developer that I'm coaching at the moment. And this is what it looks like for her. She's only ever doing two items in progress. One is normally a reading item, the other one is normally a coding item. She's got a lot of things that she wants to do, 
and she's got an entirely large backlog of things that she's going through, and then you can see the items that are done. You'll notice there that she has just booked and since got her learner's license, and imagine how amazing it was when I stood at the user review and announced to 50 people that she had just got her learner's license and everybody celebrated with her. Made her day. She was very, very excited. But that's a Kanban board for a, for a junior developer. Now, inter interesting enough, I'm also taking a senior developer through the paces of moving from um, developing, um, you know, in a different technology in a, in a different space into the enterprise space. And his board is also in a Kanban space. So where we're still trying to understand and grow the foundation of a developer or a tester or a BA, we need to actually move it in a more Kanban space. For Scrum, you'll see that there's a lot of things in progress, there's a lot of things in plan, and this is a board for a more senior person. You can see the reds are a lot of company things, the purples are a lot of community things, and there's some technical elements, but this is where we have a bit more of a scrum kind of effect where things are running a little bit longer. Um, a little bit All right, so that's the difference, and that's the approach that we would take with Kanban versus Scrum. So with every set of patterns, there's also some anti-patterns and some things that I want to share with you when we start looking at growth of individuals. The most important aspect of this is the context switch burnout. So we talked about the fact that we have learning time every Friday afternoon, and generally that's when most of the guys spend their time doing their development. Except, of course, if you're a junior and an apprentice, we give you more time to learn on the job. We kind of like balance where you're going. We bring our abilities down a little bit. Um, insist that you build 90 to 100 hours so that you can actually grow and develop inside the organization. So they get a little bit more. But more of the senior guys and more of the people that are in that developer role battle with this element, which is the context which you burn out. So every Friday, you, you put down the work that you were doing this week, the stuff that you've had inside your mind. And now you pick up the project that you were working on, maybe a bit on Saturday and Sunday, maybe a bit, a bit on, on Tuesday, but you haven't seen it in a couple of days. And so there's this, there's this energy and extended frustration of actually taking your head back into the space that you were in last week. And so what you find is that with this context switch, you actually progress a lot slower. All right, and people start getting frustrated and they start getting demoralized. And so this is you are about to do a mark on building a full stack application. Go and find a business problem that you want to solve. Oh my hat and they come back with some interesting problems like I want to solve the problem in the music industry, or I want to solve the problem in this industry, and I want to solve this problem. And I'm like, dude, it's a growth project. So let's, let's, let's be realistic. And so being over optimistic is something that we really need to try and curtail. And I know it's like, oh, you know, it's really difficult. I really want to solve this problem, and you're standing in my way. Well, let them go for a couple of months, and they realize that it's actually quite difficult, and then allow them to rein in. Ed, incidentally, the person that I was talking about, decided that Ed was going to do some stuff in functional programming and spent two months of his whole career doing some functional programming, which he hated, he didn't enjoy, it wasn't really moving forward for him. And I let him run. And then we did a retrospective, and his retrospective was pretty lousy, and then he looked back and he said, I was over-optimistic. Sometimes you actually need to let, let people bang their heads, just don't let them go on too long. But being over-optimistic is something that you need to try and caution to. And then not listening to the wrong. So in the early days of this, I was particularly bad at this, was not listening. I had a vision, I had an idea. Agile is really cool, but applied to the growth and development of, uh, of, of staff. And not listening often gets you into some trouble. Be, be open, be listen, and be always listening. So what does the current process look like? So it currently looks something similar to this. So we go through this 90-day process. We do three of them a year. Why do we do three when you would probably do four? Christmas and New Year and that whole shutdown period actually gets in the way. And so we run this from January all the way through to November, somewhere around there. Um, and, and we also give people some leeway. Sometimes you're not connecting, sometimes people are on leave. But it gives some people some flexibility. So we build some flexibility in by doing three. We feed back into HR. HR does some ad hoc re re uh, reflections with us. We feed back into directors. Directors have influence on the role, the role process, process inside the organization. We get the mentors and the mentees, but mentors, the coaches and the guides together. 
there's some adult reflection there, and we're constantly feeding back into the system to make it better. So we've got this constant flow of nukes inside the organization. Is it going well? Still getting all of this right at the moment, it's taking a bit of time. Is this going well? We're getting much, much better at doing that. Every iteration will get better. And I think once we get this process going, we're probably going to get this all done. That process working on the whole world. So what is the outcome at Collider Code? So we went through this process of prototyping this idea for about three years, and then we said, we're going to roll it out. We rolled it out. Um, we had a lot of technicians rolling it out, but we rolled it out nonetheless. And what, what came of this was just a connection of people. Just a connection inside the organization. If you have a look at what happened, we have these dimensions inside our company. Every year we go through this thing called the climate survey where we anonymously check in with our staff. It's done by a third party. They come in and ask a whole lot of questions. There's probably about 45 questions on these dimensions. And we plot where we are in the organization. In 2017, we were here. You can see performance recognition, career development, training, communication, job satisfaction. They were all relatively low. Then when we started connecting with people and we started doing a hell of a lot more connection on career and where you're going, you'll notice that this jumped up to 2018 where you start to get these, these, these developments. 2019 results are out. We're just skating underneath this line at the moment. We've got some work to do. We've got some elements where we need to go and actually implement this back in again. But we've got some more feedback elements that we need to be focusing on. on. How do we recognize performance? And I guess that's the next time I'll see you guys to talk about it, is how do we bring performance reviews back into this audit, into this conversation, and how do we get training and development back into the organization? Because that's, those are two keys that we're actually missing on when we have a look at this 2019 results. Right, so that's Agile Mentoring. I thank you very much for joining me this morning, and I'll open the floor to any questions.